Greetings. I think we should give Bad a big hand. He started something here. All right? Thank you. Thank you. You know, I was telling uh, Brad and Mark backstage, I've been working conventions now for 45 years, all over the world. I have never seen a convention like this. This was phenomenal, you know? And I think one of the most brilliant parts of it is when all you folks are up at the front here and BK said, just sit down. Usually they'd say, okay, now go on back there and sit down. <laughs> that, that was brilliant on his part. I, uh, I want to give you um, possibly a little different perspective on this revolution. Because I went through a revolution many, many years ago, about 52 years ago. There's a lot of people here going through a revolution, but it's inside, it's not outside. And that's really where it starts. Everything you see happening in this company is all happening because of something that happened inside a few people, and then it was supported by the wisdom of the executive staff in this company. And this thing has taken on a life of its own, and you're finding young people all over the place that are motivating their parents now. You see? The revolution that has to take place is inside ourselves. I was talking to Mark at the back, and he was talking about culture. And I said, well, you know, culture is really a paradigm. That's what a, 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 a culture is. Culture is nothing but a group of habits. When you talk about a culture, a different culture, a different country, or a corporate culture, you're talking about the habit patterns in that particular group, in the company or in the, uh, in the country. And when you get past the culture, people are essentially the same. But the culture makes an enormous difference. To sit in here and see some of the stories that you're going to see from the front of this room, it's going to move you, but unfortunately, many people go home and whatever moved inside went right back to where it was again. And the change just doesn't happen. And if that change is going to happen, you're going to have to make it happen yourself when you leave here. A paradigm is a mental program that has almost exclusive control over our habitual behavior, and almost all of our behavior is habitual. Very little thinking. If you watch people moving, they don't think to move. You don't think to get dressed. You might give some thought to what you're going to put on, but not how you're going to put it on. When you watch people doing things, driving their car, they're not thinking. It's all automatic. Their, their mind is off somewhere else. Well, this is controlled by a program that's in our subconscious mind. And it's the very reason why 90-some percent of the population live their entire life and never do anything of any consequence. The beautiful part about this is that if you get caught up in this, your paradigm will change. I was sitting talking to uh, Alex and Bryce and a couple of them in the hotel um, in the coffee shop. I come in to have breakfast with Linda and Colleen, and they were saying, so I went around sat down and talked to them. And I was congratulating them on what they've done because they're just making the thing sing. And we got talking about why people don't follow it. Their paradigm's got a grip on them. Friends that you've got, they'll watch you get a nice car, earn money, and then they'll go the other way. 
And as I said, some of them that you think are your friends or have been your friends, they will stop talking to you. And I think it was Bryce said it's already happened. You see, I went through a similar thing when I was 26. Only I did it alone. I got into the book, into Think and Grow Rich, and everything in my life changed overnight. No formal education, no business experience, a horrendous work record. But all of a sudden, I'm earning tens of thousands of dollars, took over a million, and I had no idea what I was doing. But people that I thought were my friends, a lot of them stopped talking to me. And I was telling uh, Alex now, I said, they will resent you some people because you're so successful. And you must not let those people bother you. They're not ready. But there's all kinds of people that are ready. And being a great example is so important. Do you know, Joe Barker wrote the book Paradigm back around 1990. And it's an incredible book. But he said to be able to shape your future, you have to be willing and able to change your paradigm. In other words, you've got to be willing and able to get in on this revolution. You've got to get it inside. Not outside, inside. And if you don't, it's not going to happen. We see stories of people that have come from the back. I was talking to one person who wasn't even here last year, but he's in the black chair. He was over, I'm not sure who it was, but he's moving pretty fast. But you've got to be willing, and then you have to be able. You've got to be willing to do the work. You know, when you see these young people, men and women going to ambassador and star ambassador, in nothing flat, they're just going like rockets. They're working. They're not just sitting, letting it happen. They're out there talking to people. And they're making group presentations. When you make up your mind, you're going to change your paradigm. Every day is another opportunity to change your life. And it can just keep getting better and better and better. I think it was Alex asked me something about Think and Grow Rich. I said, I read it every day. I shave every day. I get dressed. I have a shower every day. These are habits. I don't have to think, should I shave? Should I shower? Should I get dressed? You automatically do it. Well, it's a habit to read this book. And you think of what's in it. I just opened this. It opened in persistence. Um, Napoleon Hill studied the lives of 500 people. He spent his whole life doing it. And these were successful people. I mean, the real heavy hitters. And he found that there was a golden thread running through their life. And he took it and he put it in this book, put it in the laws of achievement from which this book came. Well, you're going to find with this YPR group, there's a golden thread running through them. They're all doing something similar. But your age hasn't got anything to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do with it. They're just getting caught. I was saying to Linda the other day, I said, they're working in the right place. I said, every year a whole group comes back into school, new ones. They could just stay there and keep recruiting the same place over and over and over again. You, know? you want to get into the habit of doing something that's going to guarantee you moving ahead. I'm in the habit of reading this. I've been in the habit of reading it now for half a century. And every day, I have an opportunity to change something in my life. And my life just keeps getting better, and it keeps getting better every day. But it doesn't happen by accident. The beautiful truth is that every one of us here can really write our own ticket. Now, I want to make the focal point here a personal growth proclamation. I came across this shortly after I started to read that book. And anybody that follows this will not only become very wealthy, they will help a lot of other people become very wealthy. 
You know, a Spanish distiller one time said, the good life is expensive. There's another way to live that doesn't cost as much, but it isn't any good. Well, we can do so much good with money. My company supports schools in Africa. The president and CEO of our company is going to Africa this year to help them build it. Okay? And we tithe 10% of everything bring, our company brings in, and we're building schools. We've got a lot of schools over there. We're doing it with Cynthia Kersey from the Unstoppable Foundation. Well, that makes a big difference. Here's kids going to school that wouldn't go to school. They get nourishing food, they get medical care, you know, just beautiful things because there's some money. Well, you get caught up in what I'm going to share with you here, and I guarantee you, your life will just keep getting better and better and better. Now, I'm speaking from experience. I've probably been in this business longer than anybody alive now. I think uh, Rowan came in about the same time as me, Jim, Jim Rowan. Uh, Ziegler came in just about the same time. Um, one of them might have been ahead of me a little bit, but they're both gone, and I'm not going with them. So, uh, you know, I, I fully intend to keep working with the concept that I'm going to share with you. Now, when I started to lean on this book, what I was really getting into is some of the best information anybody will ever get put in their hand. It's, it's that good. And if you don't own it, get it. And this book has a great story behind it. This is the man, Andrew Carnegie, who was the wealthiest man in the world back in 1908. And he had a philosophy that's there on the screen. Any idea that is held in the mind, BK was talking about this on the stage. He worded it a little different, but he said the same thing. Any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, will begin at once to clothe itself in a most convenient and appropriate form available. In other words, if you build the image that you will be pinnacle, you will be pinnacle. Okay. Now, listen, this isn't a philosophy of BK's. This isn't a philosophy of Tom or Ruth or Bob or anybody. This is an absolute law of the universe. The law is God's modus operandi. It's how everything works. It gets dark at night. The night never follows the night. Winter never follows winter. We're finding there's laws that govern our life. And he said, any idea, any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, it's either feared or revered. It's like the great sufferer in the Bible. Job says, lo, the thing I fear has come to visit upon me. That's what he's saying here. So if you're worried, if you're thinking you may not make it, then you won't make it. But if you make up your mind, you're going to make it. And it's like BK said, the only way is if you quit. Just make up your mind, you won't quit. I made up my mind I wouldn't quit 52 years ago when I first started to study this. Now, there's quite a story to this. Carnegie thought it was a shame that people like himself were going to their grave with all his knowledge that he had in him. No one in the history of the world to that time had ever written the laws of achievement. Now there was a young reporter, Napoleon Hill, that got a three-hour interview with Carnegie. He was in his early 20s. And I would imagine he was probably pretty nervous. But he got a three-hour interview with him. At the end of the three hours, Carnegie said, this interview isn't ending, it's just beginning. He said, I want you to come home with me. And he said, I was glad he took me home because he said, I didn't have enough money to get a hotel room. That's how broke this guy was. And 
They sat for three days and he downloaded all his philosophy on this young reporter. I've often thought, what would it have been like to be in your early 20s and have this happen? It must have been a, just a phenomenal experience for him. And then, at the end of the three days, he said, now Napoleon, I'm going to ask you a question. And he said, I just want a yes or a no answer. He said, are you prepared to dedicate the rest of your life to an idea for which you will probably receive no material compensation for at least 20 years? Now, I've asked myself that question time and time again. What would I have said? And every time I've come up with the answer, I would have said, yes, I'll do that. And that's what Hill said. He said, yes. It took him 29 seconds. Unbeknownst to Hill, Carnegie had a stopwatch, and he only gave him 60 seconds to answer the question. If he hadn't answered in 60 seconds, the deal was off. Now, he said, I'm not going to, he wasn't going to pay him. He said, you're going to have to find your own way. But he introduced him to the world's most powerful people. Hill became intimate friends with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison and Harvey Firestone, and Woodrow Wilson, the presidents of the United States. Now he said, there's Hill at the time, and there's Carnegie at that time. This is around 1908. And he said, now Napoleon, he said, you're going to run into some rough times. And as you start out in this business, you'll run into some rough times. And he said, everything in you is going to want to quit. He says, because that's what weak people do. But he said, I don't think you're weak. Now he said, the hill was taking notes. He said, I'm going to give you something. And this is the personal growth proclamation that he gave him. He said, I'm going to give you a statement. And I want you to write it out. I want you to underline every word. And he said, this is you talking, Napoleon. You are talking. And this is what you're saying. A proclamation is a public or official announcement dealing with a matter of great importance. And this was dealing with a matter of great importance. And this is what Carnegie asked him to write out. Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Now, here's a young guy in his early 20s, and, and he's writing this, and he threw his pencil on the floor, and he said, now, you know darn well I'm not going to be able to do that. Carnegie said, no. He said, I know you're not, unless and until you believe it. And he said, if you believe it, then it will happen. Now, this is the real deal. And a guy give me this, It'd be around 50 years ago now. And when he gave it to me, I was probably as broke as Hill was. Andrew Carnegie, Hill's saying this, I'm not only going to eat real achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Now, Carnegie's the wealthiest man in the world, and Hill's broke. And he said, I want you to repeat it, every morning and every night for 30 days. Will you commit to doing that? And he'll said, yes, I'll, I'll commit to doing that. Now, he said the first time he did it, he, uh, he was living with his brother, and he went to the bathroom and closed the door and looked in the mirror, because he told him to look in the mirror, and he whispered it, Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. He, he was afraid that anyone would hear him. Mean, they would think he was crazy. It's reported that Andrew Carnegie made something like 53 millionaires in his life. Hill said, 
by the end of the first week, he had to talk to himself and he said, you better get your attitude straightened out if you're going to do this. He's talking to himself. Yet he said by the end of the second week, he thought this maybe could work. And by the end of the month, he knew it would. Where Carnegie made 53 millionaires, Napoleon Hill has made millions of millionaires. This is a very powerful statement. And Carnegie was not teaching him to compete with them. He was using him as a mark. Yet he was saying, if I can do it, Napoleon, you can do it. Because you see, Carnegie started out with nothing. Now, I'm going to ask Tom and Bethany to come up here for a minute. Come on up here for a minute. All right. Now, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And I want you to put your hands out like this. And I want you to send love to these two people. And then I want you to repeat, uh, repeat what's on the screen. Every one of you, come on. Tom and Bethany Alcazin, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Now, come on. One more time. Say it one more time. Come on. One more time. Tom and Bethany, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. There you go, babe. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Now, do you know, some of you will think that's silly saying that. Some of you know it's not silly. I began saying that a long time ago, only I used Earl Nightingale as my mark. Earl Nightingale was the most listened to man in the history of the broadcasting industry when I went to work with him. I used to say, if God had a voice, Earl had great pipes. And I spent five years with him. And I used to say, Earl Nightingale, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. Well, do you know, when the secret went out, it's reported it hit about 380 million people. I just recently come back from Shanghai. We had 2,000 people there just going crazy in a seminar. I would go all over the world, and this just keeps happening because I bought into that. You see? And you never know what's going to happen in your career. You just never know. Do you know, for 40 years, a little over 40 years probably, I was putting on seminars, meetings with anywhere from 50 to 500, 5,000 people, always looking for exposure to expand what we were doing. One night on Larry King, I was exposed to more people than I had been in 40 years. And I got that a couple of times. I got Ellen, Nightline. You have no idea the breaks that are waiting around the corner for you. If you lock into it and make up your mind, you're not going to give it up. The most powerful recruiting tool on earth is the human soul on fire. Mm -hmm. That's what you've got going here. That's exactly what you've got going here. BK talked about the social media. Get a grip on it. Yet if you don't look after it, hire somebody, get them to do it for you. I never did it for a long time, and I got a text from BK one day saying, you should do this or you should do that. 
We hired a woman. That's all she does now. That's all she does. It's such a great opportunity for us. Now, we want to dream bold dreams and then live them. How do you live a bold dream? Well, you know, I went back and I found a number of different suggestions. Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Goethe said something similar. He said, before you can do something, you first must be something. Yet, in other words, you don't see pinnacle or ambassador or something off in a distance. See it in your mind. Accept the idea and hold the idea. Get emotionally involved in the idea. Walk like the ambassador. Talk like the ambassador. Work like the ambassador. It's not something you're going to do in the future. You know? I spoke here, I think, I think maybe it was around three years ago. And I had a presentation where we were shooting at Pinnacle. And a lot of people never took me serious. But you see, I knew what would happen because I could see people that were, the idea had got a hold of them. Well, you want to be the change. In other words, be at the pin you want to be at. When you have a meeting, are you waiting for somebody to do something? Are you taking control of it? We've got to be it in our mind. I think that's the key to top performance. It's how you see yourself. You see, if we act like the person we want to become, we take down that persona, that's the way it happens. I remember when Cary Grant died in the Toronto Daily Star, which is a full newspaper, there was a whole page of quotes about Cary Grant. And in the bottom right-hand corner was one by Archibald Leach, and it said, I acted like Cary Grant for so long I became him. That was his real name. Cary Grant was his stage name. But he took on that persona. I watched the movie Patton a lot, and I watched the movie uh, Lawrence of Arabia with Peter O'Toole. And, and you watch that, or George C. Scott and Patton, and the, the acting is phenomenal. They're not acting the part, they're living the part. That's what we've got to do in this business. You want to act like the person you want to become. Now, do you know why most people don't do that? Most people don't act that way because they're overly concerned with what they think. Nobody knows who they are. But you see, we were all raised with those rules. What would they think? What would the neighbors think? I found out they don't. You see? You see? You start acting like you're earning tens of thousands of dollars a week. That doesn't mean you go out and spend it, but you walk around with the confidence. You put on the meetings with the confidence. See, most people won't do that because we're afraid of what they think. People say, oh, you're being phony. No, you're being real. You see? You are God's highest form of creation. We've heard that two or three times in the front here. And we are God's highest form of creation because we have been created in God's image. We have creative faculties, you see. The problem with most people is they created God in their image and they've got it really mixed up. You see. We go to school and they teach us nothing about our higher faculties. We've got perception, the will, imagination, intuition, reason. These are higher faculties, but you can go all the way through school. They don't teach that. Thinking is not a subject taught in school, and it's the highest function that we're capable of. Okay. What they think doesn't matter. Don't worry about what they think, you see. 
what you think is everything. It determines your results. There is ample evidence here this week of people that came here a year ago, uh, just brand new, and now they're in the black chairs. There's people that have gone from almost nowhere to ambassador, star ambassador. Look at a lot of these young people. Men and women are going like rockets. This is a real business. Wealthy people historically have always had multiple sources of income. They haven't had one. This is the most moral form of compensation there is. The only person that can put a lid on your income is yourself. Nobody else can. Mm -hmm. You want to surround yourself with dreamers and doers and believers and thinkers, but most of all, you want to surround yourself with those who see greatness within you even when you don't see it in yourself. You see? Ray Stanford is the man that gave me this book. Ray Stanford was an ordinary guy. Probably none of you knew him. He's gone now, but he has to be the best friend I would ever have. Ray Stanford believed in me when I had absolutely no belief in myself. I was unhappy, I was sick, and I was broke. And he says, that's because you're living from your head. He said, living from your head, you're living in the past. You gotta start living from your heart. That's in the future, you see? Yet everything that's happened up to this point really doesn't make any difference. He said, Bob, make me a promise. Promise that you'll do exactly what I tell you until you find out I'm lying or I don't know what I'm talking about. If I go in to coach an executive in a company, that's the deal. They gotta do exactly what I say until they find out I'm lying or I don't know what I'm talking about. Now I'm not lying and I do know what I'm talking about. You see? You're going to find, if you can dig into the mind of any successful person, they will tell you that someone saw something in them that they couldn't see in themselves. And that's really what changed their life. Now, my whole world is about paradigms. If I go into a company, I want to change paradigms. If I sit down with an individual, I want to change paradigms. It's a subject that most people don't know. It's a subject that's not talked about very much, but it's a subject that has us locked in, boxed in, until we start to understand it. Nothing changes until the paradigm changes, because almost all of our behavior is automatic. It's not thought out. It's things we automatically do. And what we've got to do is change the paradigm. That's what these young people have done. That's what the company supported. The paradigm of the industry is changing here. Okay? Now, Barker said to ignore the power of paradigms to influence your judgment is to put yourself at risk when exploring the future. You're making decisions all the time. Just boom, like that. Hundreds of decisions. But you know something? The paradigm controls most of them. If you don't believe me, just go into any nice dress shop or menswear. Just go in on a research mission and watch. Watch people shopping. You know, the first thing they look at is the price tag. They're not getting what they want. They're getting what they think they can afford. Little do they know they could afford the whole store if that's what they wanted. Paradigms control us. Now, I want you to look at the areas of your life that your paradigm has enormous influence over. Your perception. 
Your perception is your point of view. That's how you see the world. You see? This revolution is shifting the perception of a lot of people all over the world. Your paradigm controls how you utilize your time. Do you know that everybody gets exactly the same amount of time? The hobo that's sleeping on a park bench to the most effective industrialists in the world, everyone gets exactly the same amount of time. They get all there is. So it's what we do with our time. I pride myself in being very effective with the use of my time. But it didn't happen by accident, it happened by design. I made up my mind I was going to do that. Your paradigm controls your creativity. Do you know that no one is more creative than another? Everyone is creative. There's a power flowing to and through us. And as it flows into our consciousness, we can build anything out of it we want. I was asking Mark backstage, I said, how many people did you have working on this? Because they've covered every detail. I, I'm looking at all the little things, that, and they, they, they haven't missed a thing. You know? There's about six months' work, at least, has gone into this by a quite a large team of people, very creative ones. Your effectiveness is controlled by your paradigm. Your uh, productivity is controlled by your paradigm. You see? That's the cycles, isn't it? Your logic. You know, logic is like a, a, a ceiling that stops people. Logic dictated the world was flat for a long time. Logic dictated we couldn't get in the air. Do you know the Wright brothers had to crash through logic? Yeah, it's totally illogical for a young person in their early 20s to say they're going to earn tens of thousands of dollars a week. Everybody will think they're out of their mind. But you know different. You got to break through the logic. You cannot let logic control you. Logic is, is, is bad for us. Our ability to earn money is controlled by our paradigm. One of the first things I ask a person if they come to work with me, what's the most you've ever earned in a year? I don't really care what the answer is, but I want to know because I want to know where their paradigm is. Then I know what I'm working with. Now look it. It's like we're boxed in. There's a box. And all those areas, you can't expand beyond them. Now, when you make a decision, and I'd suggest if you haven't already done it, make it right now that you are definitely going to change your paradigm. Now, when you do, when you make the decision, you don't necessarily change anything, but you know what you do? You get rid of the box. And all those areas can expand. If you just imagine how your entire life will change as you begin improving any and all of these areas. The change will be huge. You're seeing that. You're seeing evidence of it here. And get this, the change is permanent. You see? Now, I want you to consider this for a moment. Let's suppose you say, I'm going to work on one thing. How you utilize your time. Just one. Don't try and change a whole bunch of things. One thing. When I met with Brad, we two of us sat down over in the hotel. I told him, I said, don't try and change everything. Change one thing. Can you imagine if you just change how you manage your activities? Stop and think of how it's going to affect your income. Do you know that I can earn as much in a morning as the fire department in Toronto used to pay me to work for them for 12 years. What happened? Yet said I gained an understanding and I started to change things. It's, it's such a beautiful concept. Just mastering the management of your activities could turn your annual income into a monthly income. I recently was over on a tour 
Oh, it wasn't that recent. It's about three months now. I went into Israel, then I went to Cyprus, then to Dubai, then to Melbourne, and then around to Auckland, and then back to L.A. and back to Toronto. And everywhere I went, I was on a real busy schedule. There was people, could, 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 could I just get a few minutes? Could I just ask you a few questions? I didn't have time to answer questions. I had to catch a plane. If I could just get an hour with you. And it was bothering me because I was, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and, I, and I'd have to leave. And all the way, it was a lot of time in the air, and I'm thinking, how can I help them? And flying from L.A. back to Toronto, I thought I should be able to spend time with these people. Well, I figured out a way. I thought, I'm going to start streaming. Now, let me share something with you. I spend an hour a week with people all over the world. Within two days of starting this, we had hundreds of people in 35 countries. It's about six weeks later, now we're in 70 countries. And the whole thing is designed to change paradigms. Now, we sell that, but I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm going to give it to you. Now, there's a, no, wait a minute, there's no catch to this. I had them put up, I had our company put up a site, streamingwithbob.com. That will be up until about 10 o'clock Saturday morning, and then I've ordered it to come down. You can register, you'll get six months free. Cost you nothing. Every week, okay? Now, when I was talking to them at the office, I said, listen, I said, when they go on and register, I want you to set up the common denominator of success. It's a phenomenal speech that was given way back in the 30s by Albert E.N. Gray. He was the secretary to the Prudential of America. The common denominator of success is informing the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Now think of what that means. It's informing the habit. That's something you do automatic. You don't even think you automatically do it. Form the habit of doing things failures don't like to do. So those of you who register, a letter will come up telling you that you're registered, and there's a link, and you hit it, and that'll download the common denominator will download onto your computer. You have until Saturday morning to register. It's at streamingwithbob.com, and then we're taking it down. It costs you nothing, okay? Now, that is designed to help people change paradigms. I happen to believe that these black chairs could be filled with pinnacles in a relatively short period of time. Do you know what's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. I think last year the theme was believe, wasn't it? Well, people are starting to believe. They believe they can go a long way in a short period of time. They believe they can sign up large groups of people. No one knows what you and I are capable of doing. I want you to really serious think when you go to bed tonight, what are you capable of doing? Now, I got a letter from Tana, and she told me in bold and underlined letters that I could not go one second over. I am quitting 58, 57, 56 seconds short. Okay. I want to thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. Thank you. <laughs>